also this evening's podcast I'm bringing to you recording live from Bruna Bonia on a beautiful sunny October evening the sun is low in the west it's not far from setting the weather has been unseasonably mild a lot of the leaves under the feet here and I hope that the uh, the noises as I hold the uh, recorder are not too distracting so people say to me from time to time you know do you meditate do you do yoga and I say no I don't I come out here, I spend time in the Boyne Valley, I soak it up, I enjoy being out in nature, I enjoy my photography, I enjoy doing the simple things in some way of course the technology is a distraction sometimes it's just nice to be there to be in the moment which I think is a phrase that people who practice meditation might use to try to be in the moment so you'll hear a bit of extra noise here as I attempt to take a photograph yeah what a splendid evening it is here really really calm and again sorry about all the heat noise so there are clouds covering the uh, sun a little bit it's hard to believe that it's so dry and it's so mild for the time of year but I'm told that those who uh, those who have been farming for a long time would say that the autumn following a summer drought is always a good autumn let's hope that the uh, the winter isn't too harsh or too long so what a productive year it's been on many fronts And I consider myself very lucky to be able to wander around in the valley. And I think about all of those people right now who are ensconced in front of a television or in front of a screen of some kind watching something, listening to something, maybe communicating with people, maybe scrolling through pages and pages of information, useful and useless. And I just think to myself, (laughs) what a wonderful world. (laughs) And I just think to myself, how wonderful it is to be able to get away from all of that
and in the stillness of the evening to be able to do this to be able to walk around of course I never really feel that I'm on my own if I'm honest never feels lonely I mean right now I'm down in the fields of Newgrange Farm the only company down here are the sheep and the birds something very very appealing about that really nice think about all of the times in the past when there would have been some sort of a population down here a sizable population you know there must have been hundreds of people down here in the Neolithic there must have been hundreds of people down here in the Bronze Age and in later times I often wondered if they could come back and stand in these very sacred places of their own lives and their own ancestors what they might think of course that's a common theme to a lot of people who visit ancient sites they wonder the same thing it's not at all unusual to be wondering such things And so I paused there to take some photographs but while I was paused I could hear the curlews ahead of me to the southwest here a few of them and that is a call that I just find to be hauntingly beautiful it's human-like it's a soulful call for me it's one of the most beautiful bird calls but of course I'm haunted by it too because the curlews are in decline like many species of birds I don't know their fate and I know that we are interfering with that and I just think about my own imposition upon this landscape and my own presence here isn't it true that to a large degree this landscape would be better off without us or am I going too far you know we've made it a productive agricultural landscape well I suppose it always has been by nature of its location and the climate and everything else But what value does this have? You know, this place. You couldn't put a value on it. You couldn't put a price on it. It's just it's way beyond measurement in those terms. The fact is that the extinction of any single species is a great and sad event in the history of the planet and these things are millions of years in the making these wonderful wonderful creatures and I wonder how long they might have been here before the first major human gatherings here which we believe took place 
sometime in the Neolithic, probably about five and a half thousand years ago, something around that. And what the landscape must have been like in its wild and unspoilt form. It's rugged nature. It's humanless form. And how different that must have been to what we see today. There isn't much traffic around. You know, we get little flurries of visits along the roadway here, but it's a local access route. It's not it's not a main road of any kind. During the day, the buses are coming and going all the time, every hour to drop and pick up tourists to Newgrange. A great monument is sitting up on the ridge just ahead of me. I'm in the fields beneath it. And I just wonder about that call. That call of the curlew. The call that was made since time immemorial, echoing through the valley here, in the woods. The great forests that must have been here before. The, the first of the, the great monument building phases began here. And so I wonder too if the ancestors could come back and stand here and talk to us and take it all in and to look at the landscape and to see what we've done, what they would say to us. I don't think, I don't think much of it would be very good, to be honest. Anyway. The full moon is rising. The almost full moon is rising behind me. I'm going to take a picture of that. Now that's a sight. A waxing moon. Oh, well, it's, I mean, three quarters. It's waxing gibbous. It's a few days maybe from being full is rising up over Red Mountain. Just above the tree line. that's another thing that gets you wondering how many people how often stood here or in this immediate area watching for the rising of the moon and so the sun is setting sun is on the deck as we speak well pretty much on the deck and the moon is rising not quite opposite because it's not full yet and so of course this has been one of the major aspects of my own exploration of the valley of Bruna Bonia and by extension some of the other ancient sites Block Crew, Fornox etc you know is how important these things must have been to uh, early societies who were dependent upon the weather for agriculture and we were told of course that the people who built the great monuments here were the ones who had brought agriculture to Ireland and been its first farmers time keeping and long long before the advent of modern timekeeping methods. We had the natural ones and of course the modern ones essentially. They keep us from watching nature and they divorce us from that nature in a way. And so I think something of us got lost along the way, didn't it? We look up at Newgrange in all its monumental size and its grandeur. And of course we're in awe of the people who built it. And we're impressed by what they were able to do with meagre technology. Some people say it wasn't technology. 
well, if you might call stones technology, primitive form of it. We look up at New Grange and we think, hmm. So that's when we started doing this sort of thing. Making our mark, making our permanent mark on the landscape. It's impressive, but in addition to being impressive, it's also intrusive. It is our mark upon a natural landscape. So one must ask the question, is it uh, an improvement or a blemish? So when we started doing that, did we know what road we were setting out upon as a species? Separate, separating ourselves from the other species in making such permanent or semi-permanent changes to the landscape. In some cases, in modern times, changes that could really only be undone by cataclysmic natural forces. And so as I'm walking along the field here, I'm, I'm walking along, you know, a soil filled with alluvial gravels deposited here during the Ice Age. And that in itself was a cataclysmic natural event. And a very landscape altering and landscape creating um, natural um, event and w one wonders if it would take something similar you know to undo what we've done in some way and that in itself is an indication of the extent, I think, of the mark that we've left upon the place. I mean, I find it very difficult to imagine standing here right now. I find it very difficult to imagine what life must have been like in those early times. How difficult agriculture must have been digging the soil without the modern implements a huge amount of manual labor involved an extraordinary amount of effort by a people who lived short and well who lived short and difficult lives So the sun is pretty much on the deck now. The clouds in the west are lit up. Some of them a little bit orange. A little bit red. Red sky at night and all that. Shepherd's delight. Well I would hope so. Because the weather isn't always kind. It's nice to be able to stand here down. In the latter part of October. Not to be freezing cold. Not to be beaten by wind and rain. So it's nice. And the moon deepening now in in colour and in, in brightness and in contrast as that sun sets over in the west or in the the west southwest. Because we've made so much of it ours, the land because we've said, this is our land, this is our earth, you know, and we've commanded it to obedience. One wonders, where are the voices of the animals and the creatures and the birds, you know? Do they get a say in all this? And if not, what price? 
will that cost? What will the price of that be? I haven't been a rampant conservationist in my lifetime. To be honest with you, it's only in more recent years that I've um, developed a closeness to nature and the wild. Previously, you know, didn't take pay too much heed of it. That is something I think that, you know, is to be regretted. We're uh, so busy, you know, dealing with the modern demands of life. Making money and paying bills and doing our jobs and all of the things that come with looking after family and, you know, well, trying to carry on with life. <laughs> they come with a price. One of the prices in, in the modern world is that complete detachment in some cases. Or that whole scale, wholesale detachment from the natural world. We are in an entirely man-made environment in the homes in which we live and the places where we work and even when we're traveling to and from we're so painfully divorced from it now that now i'm beginning to understand why it's important you know and why it's important to try and spend some time in nature where possible i think ireland is one of the few european nations where we seem to have retained some aspect of that sort of ancient sacredness that ancient magic that mythical mystical feeling of being in a twilight world at times so no wonder then that you know, this place should be so full of myths. And it should have spawned so many stories and poems and songs. That inspire that feeling. That mystical feeling. That otherworldly feeling and so one imagines that call of the birds coming in on the air as I speak, the curlews are calling again. You know that call of the birds calling you home. Calling you back to the magic. Calling you to the she, to the other world. Calling you to ask the questions of yourself that you haven't answered, that you haven't asked. When are you going to come into right being with yourself? And when are you going to come into right being with the world? In accepting your right being with yourself and in accepting your right being with the world, it's only then that you can fully live. And of course, it's only then that you can fully die. Not far from the River Boyne either, although I can't see it and I can't hear it. I'm only about, I would say, half a kilometre, 500 metres from the Great River. 
right now, standing here in the calm, and the wind has died down. There was a little bit of wind as I started. It's much calmer now. The light is, sunlight is gone. The moonlight is, the moon is growing in strength. As I stand here now, I, it, re, it puts you into realization. You know, it brings to mind the words of John Boyle O'Reilly who lived in the Boyne Valley in the 19th century at a time when I suppose our impact on the earth was much less than it is now and who said and I long for the dear old river for I dreamed my youth away for a dreamer lives forever and a toiler dies in a day yeah, so when you dream, you enter eternity. When you toil, you don't last the day. And the toil of modern life is the toil towards that endless, ceaseless um, march, drive, speedy journey towards making money and spending money and in doing so of course wreaking havoc on the earth and there's an irony about that because I'm standing here with sound equipment in my hand and with camera equipment around my neck so don't think I don't appreciate the irony And I wonder too, every time the moon comes up, it's growing at the moment. It's waxing, you know. In the early times, what were the astronomers thinking? What were they doing? How were they measuring that? You know, it's often so difficult to see the moon at its moment of rising, unless it's, unless it's completely clear, because you often get a sort of, bank of low cloud and what did they see in its growing well I suppose they're always looking ahead astronomy isn't just a means of telling time it's a predictive thing looking at the moon shows you where the sun is going to be in so many months time And then looking at the areas of what look like darker circular areas on the bright surface of the moon, I always wondered too whether the story of the Kalyak dropping her stones from her apron uh, wasn't an allegory or a metaphor or a symbol of the moon as it wanes. So it's dropping bits and pieces off it every day as it's waning. And so each time it drops something, I suppose as it sets, the next day it comes back again and there's a little bit less of it <laughs> until it disappears. Incredible to us, of course, because we're so detached from it, that an apparently primitive people in prehistoric times could have not only observed the moon over long periods of time, and noticed certain patterns becoming evident but especially the long patterns those cycles of the moon the metonic 19 year cycle the saros the eclipse cycle you know because eclipses as i'm always saying happen in predictable patterns and the rotation of the nodes, what we might also call the moon swing cycle, as it waxes and wanes, you know, in and out of, you know, its extreme declinations. Of course, what people don't realise is that the moon 
it separates from the ecliptic by just over five degrees either side every time it goes around the sky it does that every month but it's just at certain times in the nodal rotation that those separations bring it to its maximum rising uh, azimuths uh, and um, you know the major standstills the northerly and the southerly uh, rising and setting and so we tip our hat to the ancestors who were able to work these things out with patient observation and with skill and of course they needed to record that we're told that they weren't literate they mightn't have had written language they mightn't have had a very complicated spoken language that's another thing that is very interesting about neolithic times so we're talking about a language that was a precursor a precursor language proto-indo-european or something similar i wonder about that i wonder about that the mythology of bruna Bonia captures some of the functions of the monuments in the stories and that's something i've explored in my own work and if that's the case and if we accept that that's the case then we must consider the possibility that the language itself and the names involved go all the way back so sheed in broga the ancient name of newgrange in the manuscripts in, in the medieval manuscripts might belong to a much much earlier time and some of its stories of course i believe go all the way back to the neolithic course our story begins in the distant mists of time far far beyond the very recent incursions upon the landscape here that marked that great phase of monument building at the neolithic oh no our story is a very very ancient one and i'm not talking about irish people i'm talking about the human race It is a long and winding pathway. It is a tree with so many branches, leading back to common roots, well, to a common bough and common roots. Who are the people who made the most sense out of all that? Who are the people who maintained an accord between the human way and the way of nature? Who are the ones who reconciled human action and human instinct with our environment were they the farmers were they the scientists were they the innovators those who developed the first stone tools those who discovered you know uh, the sowing and harvesting of grains those who first kept cattle Or, as I would like to think, were they the, the poets, the musicians, the druids, the sages, the magi, the magicians? Those whose appreciation of the environment considered factors beyond the known and the measurable and the rational. Those to whom myth was vibrant and alive and full of useful information for humans. As any of the, 
the stone tools and the implements and the methods that we used in order to grow our food and to survive in life. The myths were as much food as the plants that were growing out of the ground. I wonder too if the people who built these places could come back now and see the place. They might if they might consider it to be a bit sterile and huge amounts of open grassland harvested fields. Where are all the trees gone, they might wonder. And where are all the creatures? I mean I know still thankfully quite a healthy bird population in the bend of the Boyne. But I wonder how much reduced it is from those times. Or perhaps it's increased. I don't know. I suppose we likely never know that. And the leaves that were yesterday so vibrant Clung, clinging to the trees growing from them this past summer are now the broken and dead and dried up detritus that we trample into the ground as we walk along such is the story of human life and all life really isn't it I won't be able to bring any of this stuff with me after, afterwards. When that transformation happens at the end of life, that transformation that the people who built Bruna Bonier, Sheed and Broga, believed in so much. The transformation from corporeal form to spirit form or eternal form. I won't be able to bring any of this with me and what will be left after I'm gone what will have been my the result of my existence on this earth this meagre puny insignificant tiny infinitesimal presence What will be the net result? What will be the measurable result of that? What will anybody care in a few centuries? What will anybody care in 5,000 years? I'll be gone, won't I? Or will I? I don't know. And that is the greatest of life's mysteries and the one which arouses, in my opinion, the greatest intrigue and the greatest emotion that no matter what type of person we are, somewhere within us, whether it's buried deeply or whether it's close to the surface, is a realisation of our own feeble being, our own mortality. And the fact that our own presence here is gloriously short. And the moon will continue to journey around the earth as it has always done. And its various phases and hues and colours and eclipses will present themselves to the earth. And who will be here to see them? 
Who knows? It's absolutely incredible to think that there's 7 billion of us here. Seven billion. Let us, each and every one of us, measure and realize the effect of our presence here. And there is a multitude of effects that can be measured in so many different ways. Let us measure our environmental effect. Let us try and measure the changes. Have we done anything to improve the earth and our fellow humans and the creatures of the earth? With the sun gone, the golden light in the west, and blue light in the rest of the sky, and the moon brightening again. The sheep are still grazing away, not a care in the world. I'm sure, who'd be a human with all our thoughts and cares and worries, and all our feeble and futile cares and concerns? All the stupid things we concern ourselves with. But anyway, there's something down here that gets into you. Gets under your skin. Gets into your soul. And you make a connection. You do. You mightn't realise it, but you make a connection. You make a connection to lost ancestors. You make a connection to the trials and tribulations of people. You make a connection to their interaction with the world. You know? Their interaction with the earth and its creatures and its plants, their interaction with the cosmos. The things they left behind to show us that they were here are very important. Without those, we would have very little of their story. But of course, thankfully, we also have the myths. And so one of the most important things right now, one of the most important functions for me personally, and I think for humans in general, is to create our own myth. Is to keep telling the old myths, to revivify the old stories, to carry them on into the future. in the knowledge that those stories will continue to serve people as they always have done. I wonder if we could create a myth now. You know, to reflect our current struggle, our current situation, our current difficulties, our current lack of interaction with the natural world and our current looming environmental and man-made catastrophes. If we couldn't make a myth to serve us and to serve the earth, a myth that doesn't have at its core a violence or a wrongdoing 
or a theft or a rape or a robbery. I think that would be a significant challenge. When are we going to walk honestly on the earth again? Not trying to fool it or fool ourselves. You know, it's always about <laughs> imbalance for us. It's about taking, taking and taking away, not giving back. When are we going to live with honesty? And crucially, when the crisis comes and the great upheaval what are we going to do afterwards you know those who are left what are they going to do to ensure their own long term survival Because it seems to me we took a wrong turn somewhere. And yet, so much of what we do is right. So why the conflict? You know, we know what we should do. By and large, we know what we need to do. We know. Somewhere in our core nature, we know exactly how to live in right nature with nature. We just have refused to do it. We have fooled ourselves into following paths paved with gold. And what is gold but the material of the earth? It's just that we've decided to give it a value. A value that it doesn't intrinsically have. It's all a bit silly really, isn't it? Oh, I'll probably listen back to this and think, what a load of nonsense. What a load of wishy-washy, apologetic claptrap. Since the poets perished and all they cherished in the way their thoughts unsung like petal showers inflame the hours of blue and grey. Don't let the poets perish, even when it seems that they're speaking nonsense. <laughs>